welcome to my Bob Thurman podcast. I'm so grateful some good friends enabled me to present them to you. If you enjoy them and find them useful, please think of becoming a member of Tibet House U.S. to help preserve Tibetan culture. Tibet House is the Dalai Lama's cultural center in America. All best wishes. Have a great day. This is episode two, Buddhism 101, Buddhist belief in past and future life. The real preparation for Tantra is, involves kind of a whole view of life, actually, which probably some of you have. Some, how many of you think you had a previous life and will have a future life? How many of you actually think so? Well, quite a lot of you, actually, but some not. It's a hard to have it. Even some of you who have such a belief um, may, in some way, it may be sort of part of your split mind, like you may feel it's a kind of spiritual belief and a non-rational belief, because you were all educated in science classes, where you were, sure, you were assured by authorities that there is no soul and no mind, and that's a really crucial thing in modern science. They, and the reason they have that is that they were getting burned at the stake by the church for a, few, for a thousand years or so, so they, got, they thought that was kind of a bad deal and uh, they felt the hold the church had over people was because the people were afraid for their soul and the church controlled the destiny of their soul so they had to get rid of the soul you know and uh, they they fiercely opposed its return actually uh, it's like uh, they have like in their own inquisition in the american academia at least and a european as well i think in the science departments and they will not give tenure to someone who looks for a vital principle. In Germany in the 1830s, there was a man named von Helmholtz who was a chemist and was the arch enemy of Goethe, who argued that there was a vital principle of life principle that science should consider, you know, as well as material things. And he hated him, and he actually created something called the physicalist's oath, in English at least, I don't know, whatever that would be in German. And nobody could get you know, a professorship in, this, uh, in a German university who wouldn't sign that physicalist oath. So it's a long-standing sort of parameter of our culture that even if we think it had makes sense in a way in a spiritual thing, we sort of doubt it on a visceral level. And we live, as the Buddhists would say, we live for the purpose of this life. And actually the Tibetan analysis and also Japanese, some Japanese Buddhist philosophers and some others from other countries where Buddhism is still alive, and Japanese in a modern way, the great people of the, some of the great people of the Kyoto school in Japan, for example, uh, they consider the, the sickness of Western society, which is now global industrial society, has to do with the fact that the people operating the machines and the factories and the war equipment and the, and the whole, all the facilities of our society really, at a deep level, consider themselves not being there, not really existing. So they're just, they therefore, in a way, are irresponsible. So the planet, the host planet, is just, you know, so much, it's just stuff to be rearranged to fit our immediate sensory needs. And since there's no soul and no mind, even, it's just a brain, we, our concern for our own situation stops at death automatically. So we have a kind of negative or boring nirvana waiting for us automatically. And we kind of don't mind the boredom because it's not painful. It won't be painful. It's like we have an assured infinite anesthesia waiting us at death. And then people say, yo, but oh no, but I care about my children, my grandchildren. Oh, I'm so concerned about them. I love them so much. And of course people do. But my question was, once I had a debate with Daniel Dennett about this, and I said, yeah, Dad, you're ethical, you're moral, you like your children, you 
care for them. I say, and that's your future life. But how much do you care for them? Are you willing to change the way the society is treating the environment that your children and grandchildren will live in and sacrifice you know, your, your Mercedes and your air conditioning and, your, and the whole thing? And then he said, I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, so the, one of the there's no point in practicing tantra or practicing Buddhism, for that matter, if one has not first used one's critical faculties um, and overthrown in one's own mind that sense of sort of that one will not exist at a certain point. And even sometimes we disguise from ourselves the fact that that's a way of excusing ourselves of ratcheting up our level of responsibility for the world and for others and for the environment. We excuse ourselves for that by saying that no, no, that, no being, not existing after death is not something I, I'm comfortable with. I'm so scared of nothingness. I often like to ask people, like, I can ask you actually, how many of you here are scared of nothingness? Frightened of the, the abyss, the void, nothing. How many? Oh, you know I'm tricking you. You know, nobody's saying. <laughs> Usually, so a lot of people go, oh, oh, yeah, I'm scared of nothing. They do like that. People do. In a big audience, like, you know, 500 people. Wow, that's fun. And then I say, you know, if, if, if Rambo says, I'm scared of nothing, what does that mean? It means he's not scared. So what's the matter with you, you know, that you're scared of nothing? How can you be scared of nothing? Nothing means nothing. It can't do anything to you. It isn't there, actually. Nothing means something is not there, right? There's no there about nothing, right? And therefore, if you realize there's no there about nothing, that also means, if you st this is where you start to put critical leverage against the kind of sense that we have that we're going to escape at death from our problems. Uh, is you realize that you, nothing cannot be a place you can enter. You know, the trajectory of yourself as a being with momentum, with a mind that has momentum, you know, like energy, it can't enter nothing because it's not a place to receive you. Do you follow me? It's nothing, it's all nothing right now, and it's just it's a complete illusion. Or, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's, uh, there is no nothing, which is actually the rational thing. And so it's utterly irrational to say I'm scared, to feel scared of nothing. And the scared, being scared is the, is the pretense that one isn't looking forward to it. When I was translating the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which was an amazing experience for me, actually. I had not planned to do it. It was a commission. Someone asked me to do it. And then my original guru had said, handed me a copy of it years earlier and saying, you're going to need this. And I said, no, I don't. That's been done. I'm not interested in that. He said, yeah, no, no, you're really going to need this, he said. And uh, therefore I translated But while I was translating it, uh, the final exit, the book by Jack Kevorkian, was becoming a bestseller in America. You know, and euthanasia. You know. People welcoming what they assumed would be permanent anesthesia, you know, without, without having to beg for morphine you know, from their doctors. So in a way, so the beginning of the exoteric Buddhist path has to do with evaluating yourself as a human being. It isn't really, you know, in the general, there's a general cultural context about reliance on the teaching and the teacher and all this kind of stuff. But really the real working path of, of cultivating the spiritual life has to do with evaluating your, your life, what you are, your meaning of yourself as a human being. And really becoming more, heightening your awareness of how precious an entity you are, which is not an ordinary type of pride or arrogance or shouldn't lead to that. It should rather lead to a sense of urgency about living your life a certain way. And then if you think about it, you know, the corollary of being nothing after death is, there are two corollaries, but one is that essentially one is nothing now, essentially. Because, for example, if I, if I was about to be blown up in a fire or something and thinking that that was a painful way to die, and I had a gun, I might blow my brains out, thinking that would make me anesthetic permanently, that would be reducing me to what my essence is, which is nothing. 
So that means we are essentially nothing if we have that view. Because we don't have the confidence that, the, that we have a mind over matter. We, we don't really feel that in our culture. It's ve or it's very difficult. And I shouldn't prejudge. Some of you may really feel that. That your mind, you, you don't have to bend a spoon, but you may feel that your mind really can shape matter in a certain way. So therefore your mind has an effective energy as part of nature. And then you're a way step beyond our culture, the, the materialist culture. The scientifically materialist culture. And the other corollary is, of course, that you were nothing before you became conscious, at, not at birth, but at a certain time when, you know, Jean Piaget decides you have a sense of individuation. At around four or five, I think, in the, his, his stages of childhood, you know, or Eric Erickson, you know, those psychologists who study children. So, so then, if that's so, then how, how what, what kind of creature are you? You just came up to the illusion of having a mind at four or five, and you've nursed that illusion within this life and try to deal with the difficult environment and you try to make it as pleasant as you can for yourself. And if you're intelligent, you realize it should be pleasant for those with you, as to whatever circle you, size circle you have. And then it's all over and it was ended up, and also that has no meaning, therefore. It's a total accident, it's a random mutation. Uh, you are just a product of your parents' genes. And, you know, Richard Dawkins assures that you drop your genes off in some useful place. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> preferably, at, preferably at Oxford, where he comes from. So, so the sense of yourself as a precious being is the Buddhist Darwinian view, Buddha's own scientific Darwinian view, which is that, Yes, you're a part of a species and you're part of an evolution of animal life, although they don't believe that uh, this is the only place where there are human life forms in the vast, huge, multi-trillion planet universe. And, you know, therefore it's just this one bunch of accidents. In infinity, there can be an infinite number of accidents producing life. And uh, so instead of that, and it's just, so you are that, you know, your body is genetically adapted to this environment on this planet, and the genes of your parents have coded for it and so forth, and you receive that. But you personally also have evolved in different life forms. And you now achieved a life form, you chose a set of parents, you chose to be a human, you entered the womb at that moment, at an auspicious, a propitious moment, and you're here with this incredible intelligence. You, all of you chose to be born in a relatively free country where you had access to education and health and leisure and liberty to learn things. And you encountered teachings from all over the world. You encountered the Buddhist teaching and other religions and philosophies and sciences and so forth. And, and whatever you learn in this life will affect your future existence. And you have the capacity as a human to shape that future existence to be even better than this one. You know, if you're a good yogi now, you could be a better yogi in another life. You know, if you add the mind, you could, of course, you can't take the well-developed yogi, yogi body into the next life, but you can take the mind that knows the forms and that aspires to ever greater and greater and more open and more, more vital and more energized forms. So that makes you immensely precious initially to yourself. It means that your life is an opportunity for yourself. And it's an opportunity, of course, that can be wasted. And like a person who lives by killing some kind of you know, uh, military or criminal or something, is lowering there because the human being is chose. The human being has a soft skin, no, not, no fangs. Uh, I mean, claws, no, no decent claws. They break fingernails at the drop of a hat. They have no fangs. We're not that big and strong. You know, we couldn't wrestle a rhinoceros or something. We can, but we invent things because we can, we can speak to each other and we can create and invent and share knowledge over generations and between millions of people. It's amazing what our intelligence can do. And, can, and then we can use that to be worse, of course, than a fierce animal. But actually, we chose a life form of a non-fierce animal, kind of... That's my chicken shit theory of evolution, <laughs> rather than the MIT one, you know, the militarist society kind of view that a mighty hunter, you know, we're out there in the savannah chasing down the lion, you know, and pushing, the, telling the women to shut up and cook and all this. That's the militarist myth. 
they have. And actually, rather than that, we were that animal that was hiding <laughs> in a cave while the fierce animals were running around. And then our wife suggested, well, well why don't you get a spear, dear? <laughs> and then we listened and <laughs> sharp the spear. And, oh, okay, well, I'm a spear. And, uh, and so we learned things and we talked because we were afraid that we hid, you know. So this is the human, you know, our, we have this amazing intelligence, you know. And um, so that's how, where the path begins. And so it, it's a completely life-changing idea where it has a wonderful horizon of potentially infinite positive development. You know, the Dalai Lama is not asking us to go worship the Dalai Lama at all. The Dalai Lama is inviting us to try to be like the Dalai Lama, to develop compassion to an extreme degree ourselves and even be better than the Dalai Lama. That's what the Dalai Lama is inviting us to do. And he feels... He, he feels equal to all of us, actually. That's part of his thing. That's what compassion means. They feel the feeling of the other person as much as their own, and there are more other people, so they're more concerned for others than bothering with themselves. And, uh, and then there are degrees, and even greater degrees, of, and Dalla will be first to say, there are greater degrees of being effective at that than he is, although not too much greater, I think, given the circumstances. But I think people will not really realize that until... Tibet has become free by the free choice of the Chinese leadership, where they finally realize that Tibet is their greatest ornament as far as the rest of the world goes. And it's like a trillion dollar public relations bonanza for them to let the Tibetans be free. Of course, the Tibetans themselves, following their leader, they want to be part of China, actually. And they definitely will. Even the ones now who say, I'll never do it, all this, they will want to be when they're being treated well. So China, you know, they want to help the Chinese because Chinese have wrecked their own country, misled by American industrialization, you know, Western industrialization fantasy of life, what the purpose of life is, produce, 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 you know, and dominate and conquer, you know. That's, that's the purpose of life. You know. Just be a mindless cog in a wheel of mindless self-distraction, actually. <laughs> that's the purpose of life. And when you die, then it doesn't matter anyway what you did. It was then all an accident anyway. So um, one of the things about when you say believe in reincarnation, when first when we think of re, when we think of it as an entity like reincarnation, we think it's believing in a mystical, abstruse religious doctrine. The people here in Ladakh and and um, actually many Hindus and Taoists and things as well as the Buddhists. Uh, they, to them, the rebirth issue, the, the, the fact that human life has this extent over many lives, what, what I call the multi-life perspective, is like belief that the road from here to the Kala Chakra thing is still there, you know, and we can drive on it, or the road to stock is there, you know. It's a common sense belief. It isn't, a, a, and, it's a, and it's kind of, it's a belief in a biological description. And then people more educated know but of course, even that description, although it's considered by it was considered by the Buddha the most useful one, is not an absolute description. There can be refinements in the description. You know, it's a, it's a still if somebody, you know, it's like Carl Sagan asked the Dalai Lama. Uh, we had somebody has it on film. I've seen it a bunch of times. I wasn't there. But he said, "Well, Your Holiness, if we organize a foolproof, fantastic experiment." and prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that there's no such thing as reincarnation, what would you say? <laughs> and so all those things for a minute, he says, well, I stopped believing in it, he said. <laughs> well, I say it's just a bunch of baloney. You know? I don't think the earth is flat, you know. You know, say his jaw drops, you know. And, uh, here's this reincarnation saying he'd stop believing in it if he could disprove it. <laughs> There's two or three beats, you know, and then he looks to Sagan all enthusiastically and says, well, how are we going to set up that experiment? <laughs> uh, it was flummoxed, you know, by that, you know. And uh, what the scientists, they just dismiss it. They just say, forget it. It's, there's no evidence for it. But they, there is evidence for it, a lot of evidence for it. And you can dismiss the evidence piece by piece, say it's fraudulent and it's wrong, it's misinterpreted, or there's another way of, of understanding it. Sure, then they should carry on with that. 
But anyway, this is, for example, this is the entryway to a big, huge body of evidence, for example. Jim Tucker, Jim B. Tucker, MD, is the successor of the famous Ian Stevenson, PhD, psychologist, who was funded by Chester Carlson 40, 50 years ago to investigate cases of memory of former lives around the world and you know, deal with, look into the possible empirical validity of the, of the sort of uh, fact of reincarnation and therefore the idea of rebirth, as we would call it, unless it's conscious and voluntary, and uh, the fact of the continuum of consciousness and the big bugaboo of scientists that the mind exists, you know, that there or something exists that you call that is called mind, you know, which some people say is non-material, but actually, and the Buddhists, some some of the Buddhists say is non-material, is radically a dualistic Buddhist. There's dualistic Buddhist theories, but the most powerful and subtle Buddhist theory uh, of unexcelled yoga tantra and so on says that that mind and matter ultimately are one thing, and what mind is is super subtle level of energy, what consciousness is. And therefore that continuum or mind stream that goes from, through from death to rebirth in, a, in an unself-controlled being is, is a subtle energy. And so you can't, so reductive to, to, to matter, can, and as, a, as a hypothesis used in some context, can be helpful. But also matter to mind in some context can also be helpful, which the scientists the, the, Dalai Lama doesn't like to say that much. He, it's in his book, actually. There's one few sentences that reveal that. But uh, that book, Universe in a Single Atom, but he doesn't bring it up in conferences with materialist sciences much. And he shushes me down when I do, because he doesn't want them to be think triumphalistically that, oh, yeah, it is, so finally it's all matter. You know, the Buddhists agree with us. We're right. Because they would never agree that, that matter can be mine, actually. You know, down below the Higgs boson, and then they have that whole dark energy and dark matter, 90% of reality, which they don't know what it is. And they, they only find those subatomic particle things by secondary, tertiary phenomena that they then infer, infer fitting into their model, which is just their theory. It's just a relational theory, and it's only a hypothesis. But they, but anyway. Okay, so, so, so he doesn't, but he does, he, does, he does mention it a couple of places in the thing. Anyway, this one. These are extraordinary cases of children who remember past lives, and they have thousands of cases of this, which Ian Stevenson, before Jim Tucker, who took over that institute at University of Virginia, Charlottesville, which the psycho he was a member of the he was chairman of the psychology department when he received that grant, and he had to fight his department, and then the department had to fight the board of trustees, even in the fifties, to accept the grant and to devote, and then eventually he retired as chairman of the department and he ran that institute. And it, re it remains connected with the University of Virginia. But many of the material, majority materialists in the science departments at the University are embarrassed about it. They think it's a bunch of nonsense. But there's huge evidence of it. And amazing stories that are well documented and where a child has no, and a family of the child has no motive to pretend to some memory that doesn't exist and so on. It's embarrassing them to a radical degree and they try to suppress the memory in the child. Yet they are documented and, uh, you know, accuracy of detail and so on. So this, this I, I don't know this one. I read an earlier book by Fred Jim Tucker's first book, which I think when he first took over, it was called Life Before Life. That's what it was called. And uh, so the focusing on the children. But then there are other things. And the basic proof of it, the basic proof of rebirth is simply the law of the continuity of energy. You know, that energy doesn't become nothing. Can't. It can be diffused and can go into entropy. In a way, the equivalent of going into entropy would be a yogi who does not understand the royal reason of relativity and who develops high degree of concentration, but has not been taught that relativity royal reason. And then with that high degree of concentration, mounts through love, compassion, joy, and equanimity, immeasurables, goes past the end of, in, of coarse mass into the formless realms, and gets into realm of space, consciousness, nothingness, and non and beyond consciousness and unconsciousness, the four subtle most formless realms, and feels they've reached the absolute, and therefore doesn't return out of there and becomes a formless realm deity, and sticks there for thousands of aeons, and comes back and you know cannot find their cousin, 
<laughs> it's like 10 universes later, you know. And he's very bummed out that they didn't stay forever in that absolute. What they thought was the absolute. That would be the equivalent of entropy, I think, Buddhist equivalent. Just like, just like the boundary between the form realm at Akanishta and the formless realm is like the event horizon of mass becoming infinite, pure light, you know. Where the Buddha lands all are located on that event horizon, actually. Very sci-fi. But Buddha taught that. He taught those four things in his typology of, uh, of the universe, the form and formless realms above the desire realm where we are. And he taught that to teach those yogis, those self-centered Brahmin yogis, who were the ascetics of the day, that their, their achievement of supreme isolation samadhis was not the end of things. If you remember his biography, he first went to two yogi teachers in two ashrams. And in the first one, he attained the state of nothingness. The state of nothingness, not nothing, but the state of it. In the second one, he attained the state beyond, beyond consciousness and unconsciousness. And they both, each teacher, because he was so extraordinary, in a few days he attained it. And they offered him the leadership of the order that they had, you know, around that ashram. And he declined both, respectfully. But he said, this is not, those were not absolute. That's not what I'm looking for. You know, it's really cool. It's cooled out, ultimate cooled out, tranked out, but it's not it. And uh, they were disappointed. And actually, when he attained enlightenment, his first thought was to go back and teach those two sages uh, that had been his gurus. And then he, by clairvoyance, he, he knew they had died in between the time. You know, they had passed away. So it's right embedded in the beginning of Buddhism, this non-duality, actually. Even though they let the Hinayana or Theravada seem to be dualism. This podcast is made possible through the generous support of the Tibet House membership community and listeners like you. To learn more about the ongoing work of Tibet House U.S. Robert Thurman and events held at Menla Retreat in Phoenicia, New York, please visit menla.us or bobthurman.com. Weekly interstitial music brought to you by Tenzin Chogel. All rights reserved.